Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to uh, our second new webinars in our new series. We have broken down seven pillars of a successful sales tax strategy uh, into each of the pillars and added on a bonus pillar audit. So today we are going to talk about taxability. Next week, we are going to host rates and sourcing. Um, and we will have one more in October and then have the the last four released in November. So before we get started, let's go over a few housekeeping things. So today is a 90 minute webinar. And if you are here for CPE credit, we will need you to answer our poll questions as they pop up on your screen. You're looking for four of those. You will also need to fill out the survey at the end of the webinar. Um, and you will need to do both of these things in order to receive CPE credit. Um, any issues with this at all, please just send me a message and I will help you sort it out. And a couple other important things to note here. If you have questions as we are going along, please use the Q&A button in the middle of your screen to ask your questions. We are going to do our absolute best to address them um, at the end of this webinar or following up with you via email. Uh, again, use the Q&A button to do so. We will also be linking today's slides in the chat feature once we get the ball rolling. They will also be uploaded to Zoom and emailed to you in 24 hours. And that's where you can find the handouts as well. So let's do a couple quick introductions here. So Sales Tax and More is a full service consulting and solutions firm. We have a really great team here of experienced tax professionals who are very dedicated to fulfilling any of your state tax or related needs. So we do a lot of sales tax returns, sales tax registrations, consultations, research, and like your name states, more. So if you have questions about our services or you'd like to work with us, please reach out. We'd love to hear from you and we'd love to work with you as well. And a quick introduction for our founder, Michael Fleming. Mike's state tax knowledge is very well-rounded and he has helped thousands of companies of all sizes and in all industries and is especially well-known for his work in the e-commerce industry. So uh, Mike, why don't you take it from here? Okay, well, thank you very much, Ellie. And a uh, lot, a lot of information. Uh, yesterday we did Nexus and uh, today we are concentrating on taxability. Uh, you know, in a 90 minute, 90 minutes longer than 60 minutes, but um, we can't really get very granular on every industry in every state in 90 minutes. So we're gonna do uh, a 10,000 foot overview um, and touch on some of the things that you need to look out for from the 10,000 foot level. Then we're gonna get into a couple of, of different industries um, and do a little bit of a deeper dive there. But um, as the, the year progresses or as we go into the new year, uh, we'll be adding other industries to the list of, of industries that we're doing or, or changing them out uh, every time that we uh, do a presentation like this. So today, we're going to concentrate on tangible personal properties, services. We're going to talk about the true object test, which is important um, when we're uh, talking about services. We're going to be talking about some commonly taxed services. We're going to do a little bit of a deeper dive into SAS. Um, and then we're going to talk uh, about, and by the way, this is in no particular order here, we're going to talk about some research do's and don'ts, uh, mistakes that we see people making when they're going out and trying to research such on their own. So, Ellie, why don't we uh, get started with the first poll question, and we can go from there. Yeah, absolutely. That should be up on everyone's screen right now. Uh, we just kind of want to get a feel for who's in the crowd. So uh, the, your choices are, I am here for the CPE, have questions about taxability for a client, have questions about taxability for myself or other. And Mike, we have a really good mix out there. It looks like, quick reminder, you do have to answer these poll questions in order to receive CPE credit. And I'm going to give this a couple more seconds here, close it out, and we can move forward. Great. Good to see that we have a good mix of uh, people here. All right. So one of the most common answers when someone asks me if something is taxable is it depends because so much is depends on the specific facts of the situation or uh, 
you know, even, uh, you know, the state in lots, it's very, very fact uh, specific. Um, taxability can be very, very granular. Um, we're going to get into shipping. A lot of people, you know, sometimes give me a call and say, Mike, is shipping taxable? Well, you talk about a, a tax software company like an Avalara. They've got 28 different codes or last time I checked, they had 28 different codes that could apply to uh, shipping. So when you ask me, is shipping taxable or not? My answer is going to be, it depends. And one of the mistakes that a lot of us make is assuming that taxability type questions are yes, no answers. Very rarely is it a yes, no question. Um, now, the more granular you get in your question, then the closer you can come to a, a yes, no answer. But a lot of times it's going to be it depends. And when we talk about granularity, let's let's just go through a couple of examples here. So you may ask me if candy is taxable, and I'm going to say it depends. Well, what's it depend on? Well, in the state of Iowa, it depends on whether the uh, candy has flour in it or not. Um, that first uh, picture up there is a picture of a Twix bar that's you know candy coated pretzel for the most part. And that is going to be exempt. It's not taxable in Iowa because it contains flour. Where, you know, that uh, chocolate bar down on the bottom doesn't have any flour in it. Um, even if you throw some almonds in it, it still doesn't have any flour in it. So that will be taxable in, uh, a, in a state like Iowa. So next picture here, um, that first picture, Poland Springs, it's bottled water doesn't have bubbles in it. So that is going to be not taxable in California. Whereas the second one, you know, the San Pellegrino, that's uh, one of my favorite bottled waters, uh, that's going to be taxable in California because it has carbonation in it. Um, so uh, as you can see, uh, this can start getting very, very granular. So we're going to talk about this from the 10,000 foot overview. So we're going to start with tangible personal property and tangible personal property is something that can be seen. It can be touched, uh, felt, smelled. Um, it's something that can be perceived by the senses and it's generally not real property, intangible property or digital property. Uh, now, when we see the word personal, a lot of people think of their wallets right away. They think of their laptops, their belts, their clothes. Um, you know, they forget that tangible personal property can also be a truck or a tractor or an airplane. Um, personal, you know, sometimes throws it up. So anything that's really perceptible to the senses can fall under this uh, catch-all tangible personal property or TPP. And tangible personal property um, is taxable by default unless there's some sort of exemption and there are plenty of exemptions out there. So the exemptions can be by item, can be by use, can be by entity. Um, for example, groceries, that would be an example of something that's exempt uh, by item. Uh, in some states, uh, groceries are exempt for everybody. Uh, in other states, they're not. They're taxed at either the full rate or discounted rate. Um, if it's a state where it's exempt for everybody, then you don't have to worry about exemption certificates. Um, but uh, otherwise, uh, if some people have to pay tax, then that is a state where you'd have to worry about some sort of exemption certificate in order for it to not be taxable. Um, when we talk about exemptions by use, two types of use, a manufacturing exemption uh, or a resale exemption. These are, uh, you know, depending on how you use the items, uh, they can be exempt. And then uh, by entity, you know, local governments in a lot of states, most states are actually gonna be exempt entities. But if you go out to California, no exemption for local governments. Um, you go out to Hawaii, no exemption for local governments and nonprofits, same way in uh, both uh, uh, California and Hawaii, other states also. So um, 
when we're talking about by entity, most states require you to uh, provide some sort of certificate, you know, a, a letter from the IRS saying that you're an exempt entity is not something most states will uh, accept. You've got to go and apply for the exemption in that state. So tangible personal property by default is taxable. So and assume it's taxable unless you know of a specific exemption. And tangible personal property often stretched by statute. For example, electricity. I, I really don't think of electricity um, as being, you know, uh, tangible personal property. I mean, if you stick a fork in a socket, I guess you could feel it. Um, but uh, generally, I wouldn't think of that as tangible personal property. Yet, many states by statute define electricity as tangible personal property. Uh, electronically delivered software. That is something that, again, I would not consider that to uh, be tangible personal property if I was using common sense. But many states, again, define tangible personal properties, software as tangible personal property, no matter how it's delivered, even if it's uh, delivered uh, electronically. So uh, the states often stretch by statute what is considered tangible personal property. We can't always use just common sense. Um, tangible personal property incorporated into real estate or into real property. That's generally not going to be taxable. Now, some common terms that we hear when we're seeing this, uh, is it permanently affixed? Does it lose its identity if it is incorporated into the property? Uh, is there damage to the property if removed? So uh, this is something contractors have lots and lots of uh, problems with. Um, when do you charge the tax to your customer? And when are you considered uh, the consumer of that good and you're responsible for paying the tax at either the time of purchase or the time of use when you're bringing it into another state, incorporating it into a, a property here. So um, we're going to we're not going to go into contractors too much today, but in a later session, uh, we're going to concentrate on contractors. So we'll let you know when that's coming up. Um, Tangible personal property that's used or consumed in the manufacturing process. We said that's a, a type of exemption by use. Um, it's generally not going to be taxable, but it depends. It depends on the state. It depends on um, the, the state because each state has a start and a finish to the manufacturing process. Each state defines the process a little bit differently. Some states you're gonna see the word uh, predominant usage. Uh, in other states you're gonna see the word exclusively used in the manufacturing process. Um, forklifts are a great example. You know, you can buy a forklift in some states and depending on how that forklift is used, it may be um, exempt, you know, if you're moving something from one portion of the manufacturing process to the other, um, that could be an exempt use. But if you're moving it from one building to another building, that is probably not going to be an exempt use. In a state like Texas, um, even when you're moving it from in the same building and moving something from one part of the manufacturing process to the next. That is called intraplant transport. And in a state like Texas, that uh, forklift, very hard to see an exempt use for that. So uh, again, how something is being used, what state we're talking about can have a big impact on taxability. Now, Ellie, do we wanna to go to our first, uh, second poll question? We have four today, by the way. Yes, absolutely. That should be up on everyone's screen. And we have a little bit of a quiz. See if you were just paying attention. So TBP is taxable by default, unless there is an exemption of which there are many. You don't want it to be. TPP is always taxable. There is no unless. 
or you live in certain areas. And Mike, everyone is, uh, everyone's getting this correct so far. A uh, couple, couple of straight answers in here, but let's leave this open a quick second longer. Remember, you do have to answer these questions in order to receive CPE credit. And let's uh, close it out and move forward. All right. You know, Ellie, this is a bit of a trick question. Uh, number one is the most common answer. But what happens if you live in the state of Oregon? Well, TPP would not be taxable for you there. So that could be a correct answer also. Um, or if you live in the state of uh, New Hampshire or Montana or uh, Delaware, for that matter. Um, so that could be a right answer. We might have to tighten up on that one. All right, so let's talk about services on the 10,000 foot level. Services, unlike tangible personal property, services are generally not taxable by default. In order to be taxable, services generally must be specifically enumerated or they must be listed as taxable. Um, now, as soon as I say that, people start saying services are not taxable. That is not what I said. I said they're not taxable by default. But just about every state has some services, uh, actually all states. I don't know of a state out there that doesn't have some services listed as taxable. Um, now, sometimes a non-taxable service becomes taxable when sold in conjunction with tangible personal property. Um, so it may not normally be taxable, but you sell it together with tangible personal property, it becomes taxable. It becomes part of the sales price of tangible personal property. Good example, uh, Board of Equalization out in California, they were the predecessor of the California Department of Tax and Fee Administration. Uh, on their website, they talked about drapery. And they gave this example where someone was going out and uh, they wanted to buy drapes and they wanted to put in their bedroom. So they took the measurements of their bedroom windows and they went down, they purchased these drapes and they said, could you please alter these drapes to fit my bedroom? And uh, the, uh, the person selling the drapes uh, either did it themselves or they subbed it out to someone, but that was a taxable service because it was associated with the sale of tangible personal property. Now, this person goes home and uh, they put it in the bedroom and they sleep in it overnight. And they absolutely hate the way that this drapes look in this bedroom. So they say, you know what? I can't keep them in here. I'm going to go put them in the game room. They'll do well in the game room. So they measure the windows in the game room. They're different size. They go down to their local uh, tailor or dry cleaner, whoever's doing alterations in their neighborhood, and they ask them to um, tailor these. It's the same service, alter these uh, uh, drapes. Same service as the day before, only now it's no longer associated with the sale of tangible personal property, and that's a non-taxable service. So same service, just the facts are a little bit different. One instance taxable, the next instance it's not taxable. Uh, another thing we have look out for. Sometimes a non-taxable service becomes taxable when sold in conjunction with taxable services without being separately stated. Um, so, you know, you've got a, a, a non-taxable service and a taxable service and you don't separate them. So uh, this could be termed the lump sum sales and states are going to treat lump sum sales differently, but a lot of states say if any component of the transaction is taxable, the whole transaction is going to be taxable. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, I don't know of any states that don't tax at least some services. And when I say that, uh, especially when I'm doing in-person you know, seminars, I usually get challenged. Someone says, well, Mike, my, my state doesn't tax any services. Then we got to go into what state they're in. Um, it, here's the thing. I'm going to get myself in a pickle. Um, if you're in Oregon, that may be true. So if you are in a state that has a sales tax, then these uh, states uh, all tax at least some services. 
Uh, as a matter of fact, some states, these four, Hawaii, New Mexico, South Dakota, and West Virginia, they tax services by default. So remember we said tangible personal property is taxable by default? Well, these states uh, treat services the same way. As a matter of fact, Hawaii and South Dakota even tax accounting and legal fees. And if you're like us or like a lot of other companies, nowadays uh, we have clients across the country. So if you got 200 transactions or $100,000 worth of fees in South Dakota, uh, you may have to be charging uh, sales tax for your services or, um, you know, whether you're an accountant or whether you're an attorney, uh, they pretty much tax everything. So uh, these states are different. Here, it, a state has to be specifically enumerated or listed for not to be taxable, which is unlike the rest of the states, which are exempt if it is not specifically enumerated. However, you got to be careful because the devil is always in the details. Um, I'll give you an example. In Texas, um, there's a list of enumerated services and nowhere will you find uh, website hosting or uh, website design to be one of the major uh, uh, enumerated services. It's just not there. However, for the last 30 years, Texas has taken the position, put out many opinions and uh, you know there have been many cases, uh, uh, ALJ rulings and everything else where um, Texas views website design and website hosting as data processing. I certainly don't think of data processing when I look at uh, those uh, uh, services, but the state of Texas does. Um, so you can't just look at the big print. You can't just look um, at, okay, here's the listed services. And you can't really do this with taxability at all. You got to dig down and you got to look at how the state actually applies the statutes. What type of guidance are they providing? And this is a big, big mistake um, in states like Texas, where they have a catch-all um, that they utilize to capture a lot of things that common sense may not tell you is data processing or information services. So common sense often goes out the window when we're doing taxability studies. You actually have to do the legwork when you're doing research. All right, so the true object test um, is something that comes up a lot. Sometimes you get a service mixed with tangible personal property. They're sold together. Um, and, you know, some states are going to say that, well, you've got taxable and non-taxable together. So therefore, the whole thing becomes taxable. Uh, some states are going to say, you know, well, the uh, tangible personal property is just incidental. But sometimes, you know, both of them are, uh, you know, the services is uh, substantial and the uh, tangible personal property is substantial. And that's when a lot of states point this back to the true object test. And the true object test is basically, we look at what the customer's intent is. Was the intent to purchase a good tangible personal property or was it uh, the potential to purchase a service? Now, uh, I like to use the dumpster versus the porta potty example. You can usually find, you know, dumpsters and porta potties both on a construction site. Um, they both have to do with getting rid of waste, um, but they're often treated very, very differently. The dumpster, uh, most states are going to look at that and say, you know what? Uh, the customer really wants. Uh, the trash taken out of there. They don't care if you put it in a dumpster. They don't care if you put it in 20 garbage cans. All they care is that the waste that they're uh, creating is being hauled away and taken to the dump. Um, so the true object there is going to be the service. This is the service and that tangible personal property is incidental. It, you know, that's just something that makes it easier for the people providing the service um, to get rid of that waste. Now, let's look at the porta potty. 
while there is waste removed, hopefully that's uh, being cleaned up a couple times a week. I've certainly been to a couple of them that are god awful. Uh, you can't even get near them. They smell so bad. So we really do care that that waste is being removed. Um, however, I also want the walls. I just don't care about the waste. I care about that tangible personal property. If I'm on a construction site and I'm going in there, I want the walls so people can't see me doing my business. So most states are going to look at this and say the true object is going to be the rental of that porta potty and the removal of the waste is instant incidental. So that's really what the true object test is. What was the customer's intent? What did they think they were purchasing or what did they want to purchase? All right, so here are some commonly taxed services. Remember, not all states are, are going to tax the same services, but these are some that you'll see multiple states taxing. Uh, repair, installation, and maintenance of tangible personal property, uh, information services, uh, producing, fabricating, processing, printing, and imprinting. That fabricating is an important one. We're going to come back to that because a lot of people say, well, Mike, they don't tax services in my state. I can usually fall back on fabrication labor. Um, so we're going to, towards the end here, we're going to talk a little bit more about fabrication. Uh, protective and detective services. Um, so security guards, um, you know, private uh, investigators, PIs, but something else I've seen falling under this in some states, um, software, software that protects your computer. Uh, that's protective. Um, so we, again, we've got to sometimes think outside the box. Credit reporting, data processing services, we mentioned that in Texas, real property services like janitorial services um, are often very uh, taxable. Pest control, uh, laundry and dry cleaning, uh, personal care services. Uh, there are some uh, states that tax dog walking services. Um, and then veterinary services are going to be taxable. And by the way, a lot of drugs that if they were prescribed for a human um, may be exempt, but when they're prescribed for animals, they're still sometimes taxable. So these are uh, some commonly taxed services. They are not, this is not an exclusive list. Um, there are a lot more services that states tax um, and some states you know, tax some of these or maybe even none of these, but they do tax something. So services are often viewed through the prism of how a state taxes. In other words, the states stretch. Uh, we already talked about Texas and the website design. Uh, they look at that as data processing. But South Carolina couldn't figure out how to tax software as a service. So they said, well, it's putting you know, people together to communicate. Let's tax it as a communication service. So the, again, that's a little bit outside the box. If you're looking at this um, and you don't see SAS specifically mentioned, you got to look at how the state has traditionally done this. You got to do a little bit of a deeper dive. All right, so digital property, some states uh, are going to look at this as, uh, as a service, but uh, most of the time, uh, this falls into its own category. So Ellie, let's take this out of this presentation. This is the first time we're doing this run through here um, and put it into uh, one of the other presentations, but uh, let's, uh, let's take it out of the services. Uh, yes, some of you are gonna say, well, Mike, we're talking about digital services. Um, and uh, a lot of states are moving to tax digital services, um, but we'll cover that in a, in a different place. Right now, I want to talk about some research do's and don'ts. Um, don't try to stretch what the state says to fit what you're doing. Um, it's not a game that you want to do. Uh, I mentioned yesterday that whenever we're doing tax planning, we want to take a very conservative approach. Um, if the state could make an argument that this is taxable, we generally want to collect the tax on it. Um, and the reason why is if we don't, 
and the state comes back three, four, five years down the road and says, you should have been collecting tax on this. Now that tax that could have been coming out of your customer's pocket at the point of sale, now it's coming out of your pocket in a lump sum with the added insult of penalty and interest. We, I call that the greatest tragedy in sales tax. You're taking someone else's liability and making it your own. And nowadays, most people are used to paying tax. It's getting collected everywhere. So what are you gaining by this? Maybe you're selling big ticket items and you're afraid you're going to lose a little bit of business, but I can guarantee you, uh, you'd rather lose a little bit of business than have all of this money come out of your own pocket. This bankrupts companies. Um, you know, the average sales tax is rate is 8%, 50% of 8% is usually 4%. So we're looking, you know, uh, at a minimum, 50% is penalty and interest. We're looking at about 12% per year. And states do talk to each other. We mentioned that yesterday. So you're not just getting one state follow up on you, but probably two or three others, you know, within the next six months to a year. And if they're all taxing the same thing, um, we got a problem. I mean, that's that could be huge numbers. So we don't want to stretch what the state says, you know, because all of this is very, very granular. And um, you're not going to win that argument with the state. Now, the state stretches a lot of things, um, but we as individuals, we really can't stretch what the trade's saying. It does us no good. Um, we're going to have to make that argument that we're using to say why this is not taxable um, sticks, you know, if we get audited. So you don't want to stretch. The auditor's not going to say, okay, I see what you're doing here. And yeah, we'll, we'll agree with that. Nope, here's what it says. Here's what we meant. So you don't want to try to stretch. Um, you don't want to call a state and accept verbal guidance. I mean, I can call a state three times in a row, get three different people and get three different answers. Which one of those answers is correct? Um, maybe none of them. Um, you know, a lot of times the person answering the phone just wants to get you off the phone. Sometimes they're trying to be helpful, um, but they don't know what questions to ask you. Remember, this is very fact specific. And one fact could change everything. And when an auditor comes in and you tell them, oh, I called the state and they said this, um, they're going to say, did you get it in writing? Because verbal guidance is not binding. So uh, again, you want to be conservative when you're deciding what to tax and what not to tax. I, uh, I saw a case the other day and the person did get it in writing from the state. And the state still didn't allow them to use it because right in the, the guidance, it said um, actual uh, results may differ depending on your facts. And we suggest that you get a letter ruling that discloses all of the pertinent facts. And that will be binding. But this email is not binding company relied on the email. They did not go out and get a letter ruling. And uh, the state said, too bad, so sad. Um, so do not call a state and accept verbal guidance. That's number one. And you got to be careful if you do get something in writing, um, does it actually stay what they're telling you, it says. You know, and an email with no sort of supporting documentation, you know, Sometimes that may work, but as I just mentioned, it doesn't always work. What you want to be able to do is look at a publication, something that the state has out, um, some sort of official guidance, some sort of statute that they can either send you or they can send you to. Now, just because they send you to something doesn't mean that you can, you know, you're off to the races, you got to look at it. You got to read it. A lot of times what someone tells you is the exact opposite of what the statute says. You know, there's one instance, and this is about frequently asked questions, and we say don't use that for a sole source, uh, but 
the state followed up and said, oh, yeah, that, that frequently asked question is correct. And they came to, to me and they said, Mike, I want to deregister in the state of Texas. And I said, well, how come? And they said, well, because this frequently asked question says that um, I don't have to be registered. I said, well, the statute says you need to be registered. You know, that frequently asked question is wrong. And they said, uh, I don't care. I've got something from the state. I said, OK, I think this is a mistake because, you know, getting registered is a process. Getting deregistered is a process. Lo and behold, three months later, came back and said, hey, you were right. Um, they changed their their website. It's too easy to change a frequently asked questions page or just make it disappear. It's not an authoritative source. So, you know, if, uh, for those of you where Wikipedia was around when you were going to school, you ever have your teachers and say, do not use Wikipedia as a source. This is sort of the same thing here. You cannot use the equivalent of a Wikipedia as a source that will stand up and audit. All right, so let's go back up the line there. Um, let's go to don't assume the competition is doing it correct. Um, you know, here in the state of Texas, uh, a lot of people uh, do the website design and website hosting incorrectly, and everyone follows each other. And then the state knows that people don't get this correctly, so they target the whole industry because most of them are not doing it correctly. Um, I used a, an example yesterday about a company that was leasing into another state. Um, and it doesn't matter how big the competition is, even big companies get things wrong. So you really wanna do this yourself. Uh, you don't wanna uh, rely on what the competition is doing to make sure that you're doing it correctly. You don't want to rely on an article. Number one, you don't know who wrote the article. You don't know uh, if things have changed since then. You don't know if they were looking at the correct information. It's a good red flag. I mean, you read an article, start doing the research. So articles play their role and, you know, verbal guidance from the state can play its role, but you got to do your own research. Um, this is one people look at me and say, well, why can't you use a chart? Um, don't rely on a chart for final answers. I mean, we never use charts uh, for our research because everything is so fact specific. It may not, your facts may not fit the facts of the chart. That's number one. Number two, the charts are usually put together by some of the lowest paid people at the firm. So I'm talking about pre-printed charts. If you're having a chart created for you, then it should be uh, correct, at least at the time it's given to you. Things may change, you know, a month after you have it. But if you're using, you know, pre-formulated charts and all the software companies put them out there and uh, all of the research companies put them out there, um, and they're often wrong. I mean, I look at a chart and it says something's uh, exempt and, then I go to the citation and, and I dig through the statute or whatever they're citing. And it says the exact opposite of what the chart says. So the chart itself can be wrong or you may not fit the exact circumstances of the chart. So a chart, you know, it can alert you to issues, but then you got to do the digging. You can't just base final answers on a chart. I had someone call me the other day and, you know, they said, hey, I need a chart on uh, the taxability of shipping. I said, anyone I ever give this chart to gets themselves in trouble because, you know, like I said, Avalara has 28 codes when it comes to shipping. And you're looking for a simple answer. Is uh, shipping taxable? Well, it depends. It depends on your facts and circumstances. I'll use an example here. Tax jar. 95% uh, of their customers were Amazon sellers. This is before Amazon was selling. And they told everybody that shipping was not taxable in California. Well, that's what the big print says. But the small print says shipping is not taxable in California if it's separately stated and if uh, it's a direct pass-through of costs. So there's a couple of things there. So let's look at the Amazon relationship. It's never separately stated. It's always lumped together with handing. 
handling. So shipping and handling. Handling is going to be taxable in California. So you've got, um, you know, taxable handling and non-taxable shipping. Well, if you know what the percentages are, you can do it on a percentage ba uh, basis. But to have a lot, excuse me, uh, Amazon didn't give you that option. It was all or nothing. Do I collect tax on this or not? And number two, you don't know if it's a direct pass through of costs. Knowing Amazon, I would assume that no, they're making their piece of money on this. Um, so here you've got someone who's 95% of their business uh, was FBA sellers, and they were telling FBA sellers how to do this all wrong. Uh, FBA stands for Fulfillment by Amazon. Uh, so anyone who got audited during that period was in a lot of trouble. So you cannot just rely on a chart. You have to look at the underlying documentation. Uh, we talked about the frequently asked questions page. And I know what we have a lot of accountants on the, uh, on the line here. Some of you here to learn more. Uh, some of them, you know what you don't know. Uh, or you don't even know what you don't know, and in that you're trying to better yourselves. But there are a lot of accountants out there who know maybe their home state and just assume the rules are the same all across the country. And uh, so you can't blindly trust your accountant. You know, you got to ask your accountant um, how they stay on top of all these changes in the multiple states across the country. How many multi-state clients do you have and how long have you had them? And there are a lot of accountants out there that have great state and local tax departments, have had them forever, have the expertise to do uh, what you need them to do. There are other companies uh, or other firms out there who reach out to companies like us, uh, subject matter experts. We, you know, and they bring us in to be the expertise uh, in these areas where they're not 100% sure of the answers across the country. Um, so you gotta ask uh, your accountant how they keep current. Uh, when you're using a chart, make sure you're reading the citations on the chart. And when you're talking to the state, ask them where to find that documentation. Now, we call a state sometimes. All right, but it's after we've done our research, it's after we've done our opinions. And if there's a little bit of a gray area, we're going to say, okay, let's call the state and see what the state says. And if the state agrees with us, we feel a little bit better about the decision that we've already made. If the state disagrees with us, we're going to say, okay, what's the state looking at that we're not? And we got to go back and dig in a little bit deeper. And maybe we don't change our answer. Maybe we leave it the same because the person at the state gave us the wrong information. Um, so we do call states, but we only do it after we've done our own research and just to get a little bit better uh, feeling in the gray areas if we're thinking correctly. Um, you know, talk about calling states. They don't always know the answers. Washington's a, one of the states that usually the people answering the phones are, know what they're talking about, and they're pretty good, and they'll give you answers. But uh, we had one company that we were advising, and they were doing a project in the state of Washington. This is a question about the business and occupation. And it was a project for the FAA, and it was on an Indian reservation. So um, we gave them our, uh, our opinion that it was uh, going to be taxable. And the subcontractor uh, who they were working with called the state and the state says, no, it's on an Indian reservation. So uh, therefore, um, it's not going to be taxable. And it blew up into a big thing and they didn't trust me. And, um, you know, they were trying to prove me wrong at that point. So I said, everybody, let's get on the phone. Let's call the state together. So uh, we call the state. There's like eight of us on the phone. And uh, we ask the person that answers the phone, here's our scenario. Um, and uh, is this subject to the business and, o, uh, business and occupation tax, the B&O tax? And they said, no, it's not because it's on an Indian reservation. And I came back and I said, but the work 
is be not being performed for a member of the tribe or an individual. Um, it's being performed for uh, the Federal Aviation Commission. So uh, does that change the facts enough that your answer will change? And they said, no. So I said, okay, can you please put us on the phone with your supervisor? So we got on the phone with the supervisor and I explained the situation. And she said, oh no, that's taxable. The work has to be getting done for a member of the tribe or the tribe itself. So um, even a state that usually does a great job uh, providing answers can get it wrong. Sometimes they don't know all of the facts or they don't know how a specific situation can change whether something is taxable or not. So you've always got to do your own work. You, there are no shortcuts when it comes to research. And if you're taking shortcuts, you're going to end up usually paying for it at some point in the future. Um, all right. So what are some of the charts, uh, excuse me, some of the research sources out there? You've got CCH, which their Walters Kluwer's uh, division has a lot of good research projects. Uh, we do subscribe to that. You got BNA, which is Bloomberg, another great resource out there. We subscribe to that. Uh, you got Thomson Reuters uh, Checkpoint, and that's a great uh, resource, and we subscribe to that. Uh, and then you got TTR. TTR was uh, really a, a good resource for enterprise type companies. Um, I, I've tried them out. Uh, I didn't think they were great uh, for our situation, but then they were purchased by Avalara. So uh, still a good company. They're more expensive than the others. And um, if I'm spending that much money, I want them to be 100% accurate. And they only, they're not always are. Um, we offer a premium portion of our website. We call it the Salt Vault. And there's a lot of resources on there, lots of charts. Despite what I say about charts, they are a good place to start. They can get you pointed in the right direction and other proprietary resources that we put together. And we're... Uh, uh, you know, if we're putting it together, we, we're confident in, in what we do. So these are some research do's and don'ts. Um, and uh, if you have any questions about them or, you know, if you're in a gray area, um, I always say, if you're in a gray area, tax it. Because if the state comes back later on and you're taxing it, the money's coming out of your customer's pocket. Whereas if you decide not to tax it and the state says you should, now all that money's coming out of your pocket. So greatest tragedy in sales tax. Ellie, we want to go to the next poll question. Yes, absolutely. Um, the question we have here is, which of the following should you do or not do when it comes to research? And the choices we have here are don't try to stretch what the state says to fit. Don't use an an FAQ page as a sole source, or do ask the state where to find documentation. Um, and then the last answer is all of the above. Quick reminder, you do have to uh, answer these questions in order to receive CPE credit. Mike, most people are answering all of the above, which is uh, the correct answer. These were all listed on that last slide of research do's and don'ts. And uh, let's give everyone a couple more seconds, close it out and move forward. All right, look at you, Ellie, getting aggressive and giving correct answers. I like it. Yep. I'm, All right. I'm ready. So, I know these answers. <laughs> <clears throat> You've heard them on, uh, enough by this point. All right. So let's look at shipping and handling. So handling is generally going to be taxable in most states, not all states, but in most states, handling is generally going to be taxable. And shipping is going to vary between the states, and it's very, very fact dependent. So uh, some of the factors is shipping mandatory or optional. In other words, in order for someone to get your goods that you're shipping to them, um, is the shipping, do you have to do the shipping or can they come by and pick it up? 
you know, uh, Illinois is a, a, an example of a state like this. If the shipping is mandatory, if the only way that they can get the item they purchased from you is by having you ship it to them, then that's what we call mandatory. And the shipping becomes part of the sales price. So if you're talking about a taxable item, the shipping is now taxable. If it's optional, if you can, you know, go and pick it up, you know, at a local store, then they look at that as a uh, an optional service and services are not taxable in a state like Illinois. So therefore, it is not going to be taxable. So that's something in many states we got to take a look at. Is it mandatory or optional? Uh, can shipping be separable from the sales transaction? And that doesn't mean that the charge is separately stated because maybe you can't separate it from the transaction. So even though it's separately stated, you can't get these goods without paying that shipping fee. Can't be separated. So even if it's a, a separated on the invoice, can you get the items that you purchased without paying that fee? And if you cannot, then it can't be separable. If you can, like in that Illinois example, um, then um, it's not taxable. Uh, is the charge separately stated? So some states say, hey, if you combine it with shipping, excuse me, with handling, then it's going to be taxable. You have to state shipping separately from the handling in order for them, uh, for the shipping to not be taxable. Um, some states just come right out and, and say, hey, uh, we consider shipping to be part of the sale price. So you got to look at each state and how they approach shipping in order to determine uh, uh, whether it's taxable or not. And you also have to look at your process. So it's not just what the state is doing. How are you doing it? Because those two intersect. Um, in order to get the correct answer. So when people say, Mike, you get a shipping uh, chart? Yeah, I got a shipping chart, but it doesn't go through all of this. It either tells you it's taxable or exempt. And you got to dig through all the facts in order to get it correctly. Uh, by the way, here's one thing that it's pretty much universal. If the item being shipped is not taxable, shipping and handling are generally not taxable. And one of the big reasons for that is... Uh, you know, the charges often become a part of the sales price. So if the item is not being taxed, then neither are these things that are part of the sales price. Um, so uh, that is something that we want to keep in mind. I've got a, a chart here. Um, you know, let's look at Colorado. Uh, I don't know if you can see my, it's uh, one, two, three, four, the fifth from the bottom. And this is one of those states that says excluded if charges are separable from the sales uh, transaction and they're separately stated. That's one that trips up a lot of people because they're just saying, are they separable? Uh, oh, yeah, they're separately stated. They're, they're meeting number two. So we're not going to charge uh, tax uh, uh, on our sales to Colorado. Well, if you're an online seller, Usually, you don't have some place for someone to pick things up, and online sellers in general should be charging tax on their uh, their goods unless there's some other way to get them to the customer. A uh, state like uh, Connecticut just says they're included, um, and if you look out in the comments section, charges to deliver exempt items are excluded. Um, so if they're saying it's included. Um, you can generally, uh, you know, agree that, hey, this state definitely taxes uh, shipping charges. So Arkansas, another one um, on this list here. Um, so when it gets very, very granular. So let's look at California. Excluded if charges are separately stated and delivery is made directly to the purchaser by independent contractor, common carrier, or the U.S. Postal Service. Well, that language is important because if you're delivering in your own trucks, then that means that's going to be uh, taxable. Um, and then you've got all these other notes here. Um, 
in the comment section. Um, however, nowhere does it talk about in here um, about it being a direct pass through, uh, at least that I see here, um, direct pass through of, of the charges. So um, again, charts are a great red flag. They can point you in the right direction, but you don't want to base your final answers on a chart. All right, so we talked about California. Um, handling charges are generally subject to tax. Uh, separately stated shipping charges may be excluded if the shipment is made directly to the purchaser via US mail, independent contractor, or common carrier. Uh, any amount charged for shipping in excess of the actual cost of the transportation must be included in the taxable sales. A lot of people, they, they can't get that granular, so uh, they should just be taxing the, the full amount there. And the charges are taxable only if the sale is taxable. So here is a, a, a good chart out there um, on uh, the different types of uh, scenarios that you may run into. California puts this out. Um, it's uh, tax publication 100. It's about shipping and delivery charges. Um, and they'll tell you um, the condition of the sale of property. Sale is not a taxable transaction. We go to the notes. Related charges are not taxable. Uh, we look at sale as a taxable transaction. Delivery related charges may be non-taxly, partially taxable, or fully taxable. So it says right here in the California publication, they may not be taxable. They may be fully taxable or partially taxable. How can you get a one word answer on a chart? Oh, that's what most people are looking at. They don't realize how multifaceted uh, taxability can be. It's all very fact specific. Um, delivery charge is not taxable when all of these conditions apply. You ship directly to the purchaser uh, by common carrier. Your invoice clearly lists delivery, shipping, freight, or postage as a separate charge and the charge is not greater than your actual cost of delivery to the consumer. So um, all of those items have to happen in order for it to be fully not taxable. So I'm not going to go through all of these situations. They're in your materials. You can take a look at it and you can see um, you know, how complicated. Something that many of us consider to be extremely simple, how complicated it actually is. So if a, if a subject like uh, shipping can be so complicated, uh, when I have people call me up and ask uh, something that is widely taxed differently from state to state basis, maybe it's, um, maybe it's a service and they say, hey, is this taxable? <laughs> Depends. What are the states? What are the facts? Um, and you'll see why the facts matter as we get into uh, uh, software in, in, in a minute, but um, just remember, shipping can be this complicated. How complicated can other items that we believe to be complicated to begin with be? All right, so when we're talking about software, here are some factors that impact taxability. Is it canned? And canned means, is it pre-written? You know, is it something that can be taken off the shelf or is it custom? Canned or pre-written software, that's generally going to be taxable depending on the method of delivery. Um, but if it's delivered on a physical medium like a thumb drive or uh, some type of disk, uh, I don't know of a state that doesn't tax the software. Um, custom software. Most of the time, custom software is going to be be exempt. Not always. Some states will tax custom software and is something actually defined as custom software in the state. That's a big thing. A lot of people think, well, you know, this is canned software. And yes, they're tweaking it. So that's going to make it custom software. Now there's formulas in a lot of states, how much of it has changed. Some states say, if any part of this is canned or pre-written, 
then it can't be custom software. Um, so uh, the facts of the situation are very, very important. The method of delivery. So we, uh, I was just talking about if it's delivered on tangible medium, like a, a CD or tape or flash drive, uh, a computer. If something's loaded into a computer and the computer is delivered, uh, all of that is generally going to be taxable. All of that is considered to be delivered on a tangible medium. Now, delivered electronically usually means downloaded or sent by email. And some states like California are going to say, no, we don't, we're not going to tax that. But Texas is one of those states that uh, says, hey, software is tangible personal property, no matter how it's delivered, whether even when it's downloaded, we consider it to be tangible personal property. So you're going to see a, a discrepancy between states as to some of them that do tax downloaded software and some of them that do not. Now, load and leave is also looked at very differently. And um, load and leave is when someone comes out to your business and they're going to load the software onto the computer while they're there, but then they're going to take any of that tangible medium with them when they leave. So each state will look at load and leave a little bit differently also. So the facts matter. And when it comes to software, the big facts are, is it uh, you know, considered can uh, or custom? And how is it being delivered? Now, here's a chart. Uh, this one here, um, and uh, Ellie will be giving these out also. Uh, this is about downloaded software. And again, you cannot use this as your final answer, but it can point you in the right direction. Um, so uh, one of the reasons I'm, I'm showing you this is because uh, software as a service, which we're going to talk about next, um, is taxed differently in a lot of states than electronically downloaded software. So software as a service um, is, you know, type of cloud computing. It's a term used to describe the delivery of computing resources including software applications, development tools, storage, and servers over the internet. So some states actually break it out nowadays. You've got software as a service or SaaS. You've got infrastructure as a service or IS or platform as a service, which is PaaS. And um, some states don't break it out. They lump everything under software as a service. And some states don't address any of this at all. Then we got to do our best guess. You know, we got to look at how they treat other types of services. How do they treat um, software in general? How do they treat digital goods? How do they treat, uh, you know, uh, downloaded software? And we've got to come to uh, what we believe our best uh, hypothesis is about that particular state. Um, but some and more and more are, are starting to really talk about what software as a service is as opposed to infrastructure as opposed to platform. Here are some basic definitions of what they are. Again, this is going to be in your slide deck, so I'm not going to take the time to go through all of this. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more of software as a service because this is the one um, that we run into the most. Now, here's uh, some information uh, about software as a service. Uh, as I just said, more states address SAS than they do the other two. Uh, some states don't address it at all, and we're left with our best guess, looking at how they treat other software and how they treat so services. Uh, some states treat this, you know, SAS the same as other software. And other states take an approach that's entirely different. Um, Texas, we talked about data processing. That's their catch-all. Well, software as a service, they tax as, lo and behold, data processing. And data processing, by the way, is only uh, taxable on 80%. So the first 20% is actually tax exempt, the 80% after that. And that's for all uh, items that fall under data processing. Uh, we mentioned earlier that South Carolina taxes this as a communication service. Uh, Arizona, 
they look at this as the licensing of tangible personal property. They're one of those states that, you know, define um, SAS as tangible personal property because they're saying, hey, you're licensing it. And by the way, since you're licensing what they consider to be tangible personal property, um, if, uh, you know, you are, are utilizing uh, uh, service in the state of Arizona, um, or if you've got someone in a home office that may or may not create Nexus, um, if they're utilizing the software, software in the state of Texas, uh, excuse me, in the state of Arizona, um, that's considered to be Nexus creating. So not all states look at how to tax this. We said earlier that states will stretch what they tax um, in order to fit uh, your products and services. They, they're looking through their prism of taxability and saying, okay, what can we call this? How can we tax more goods and services? And uh, which is how we end up with the licensing of tangible personal property, communication service, and then again, uh, data processing. All right, so this is, is something most people get wrong. And if you look at any of the charts out there, um, they don't address the locals. So in some states, software as a service is not taxable at the state level, but it is at the local levels. For example, Colorado, uh, they don't tax SAS at the state level. However, the majority of the self-administered jurisdictions do. And if you ever look at the breakdown of where your exposure is in Colorado, the amount of tax collected at the uh, set for the self-administered jurisdictions is usually greater than the amount of tax you collect for the state. I mean, it's like 2% for the, or 4%, I forget off the top of my head what the rate is in Colorado. But the rates in the local jurisdictions are much higher than whatever it is at the, uh, at the state rate. So you could be racking up a whole lot of uh, liability thinking you're doing things correctly. Uh, Illinois does not tax software as a service at the state rate. Um, and that uh, is wrong. It does not tax software as a service at the state level. Uh, however, it does when we're talking about Chicago. Chicago has what's called a non-possessory computer lease. And it sort of follows the same uh, thought process as Arizona does. Um, if you're leasing something that you don't have possession of, that's how they're looking at SAS and that's how they're ending up taxing it. Here's a chart. So remember, charts are a great place to start, but you don't want to base final decisions on this. And go down to Colorado, they're going to tell you it's exempt. And uh, obviously, we just talked about it at the local jurisdictions, it is taxable. In Alaska, they're going to tell you it's not applicable because Alaska doesn't have a state level tax. However, uh, they have what's called the Alaska Municipal League. A lot of the local jurisdictions, the municipalities, the boroughs have gotten together and they said, hey, Alaska Municipal League, will you please administer these taxes for us? and collect them and help uh, uh, taxpayers get us the money efficiently. Um, so they have. And if you have $100,000 or 200 transactions into the state of Alaska, and someone is a member of the uh, Alaska Municipal League's sales tax project, then you're supposed to be collecting and remitting the tax. And software as a service is going to be uh, taxable for all of those jurisdictions and as we mentioned, uh, Illinois. So sometimes even the software you're using can't get this right. And now we've got to uh, look at creating custom codes or custom rules in order to collect uh, the sales tax correctly um, in some of these jurisdictions. Now let's talk about this case study. Um, and, and this uh, we wanna talk about for a couple of reasons. Um, uh, one is it's a knock on charts and people who rely on them. 
In case study number one, we were approached by a company to do research. They told us they were a SaaS company. They wanted us to confirm that the chart was correct. Now, when we do research, we ask for sample agreements. We ask for invoices and we ask for the company to provide us a written description because we want to see what they think they're selling. Because uh, that's very important sometimes because what they're writing will often disagree with what they're thinking. And, you know, when an auditor comes in, they're going to look at the uh, invoices first, they're going to form an opinion there. They may go to the agreements um, and the agreement will generally override the uh, the invoices. So what you have in your invoices and your uh, agreements, they should all line up with the way that you're thinking. And if they don't, then we've got to work to make sure that they do. In this particular situation, Everything they sent to us, starting with the description of what we do, uh, the most important step is what they told us is to download our software. Okay, right away, that's a big red flag for me. The agreement they gave us was for downloaded software. Talked right about it. Hey, you know, here's the agreement that uh, the licensing agreement of how you're going to use our downloaded software and the invoices reference downloaded software. So I don't care who the auditor is or from what state, there's no way that that auditor is going to look at this and say, come to the conclusion, oh, you must be selling software as a service. I mean, you told me that the most important step is downloading your software. And it wasn't an applet. I mean, they have a full blown agreement. They get so mad at me for telling them they weren't selling software as a service or in our opinion, we didn't believe it would be software as a service or that any auditor would believe that argument either. Um, we believe the states are going to uh, view it as downloaded software. So we said one of the limitations of a chart is a lot of times you don't fairly uh, squarely fit inside the box that the chart is talking about. And sometimes the chart may be 100% correct, but it's not a chart that you should be using. Um, sometimes, you know, that's the hardest part. In this particular case, there were a couple of uh, things wrong on the chart, um, but the chart didn't even apply to that. And they got very upset with us because we were telling them, hey, this is not the chart. And the reason why they were upset is that uh, software as a service is only taxable in roughly 20 states, you know, maybe one up, one down, it changes all the time. Whereas downloaded software is in the high 30s, you know, so there are a lot more states to get registered and a lot more states to collect tax in. Um, but this company goes along, they, you know, say that their software is a service, they ever get audited, all of that money is going to be coming out of their own pocket. Um, in the states that tax downloaded software and not um, software as a service. I call that the greatest tragedy. You could have collected it. I told you you should have collected it, but you chose not to. And now the state's coming back for you. Could be three years down the road, five years down the road, 10 years down the road, uh, depending on the state. So uh, that's case study number one. This is case study number two, and this is almost the exact opposite. We're approached by a company to do research. They told us that they were a SAS company. And again, they wanted us to confirm that this SAS chart was correct. Now, that's the good news on both of these companies. They wanted to make sure that the chart was correct. Now, the problem with the first company is when we told them they're looking at the wrong chart, they didn't like that. With this company here, they didn't fit the chart again. However, um, they were remotely accessing data and most states do not look at that as software as a service. So where they thought they had to get registered in 20 states, when I came back, it was like one or two states uh, where they might have to get registered um, in order to uh, uh, be compliant. So that's a big difference. Here's a company, we're so glad that they came to us and had us go through this. Uh, because we're looking at their contracts, we're looking at their invoices, 
Um, and we're looking at a description of what they do uh, written out in their own hand. Um, and by the way, we also compare that to the uh, website because sometimes if the website doesn't match what you're telling us and it doesn't match the agreement, you know, uh, the auditor uh, can see that and all of a sudden they're down a rabbit hole and it's hard to get them back on track. So we want to make sure that everything that the auditor is going to see lines up. They all match each other. And in doing that for these people, uh, they hardly had any exposure whatsoever uh, because most states don't tax, uh, don't tax simply access to remote data, even if you're using software to do it. Now, clothing, changing gears on you here. A lot of people think that clothing is going to be uh, pretty easy to do. And in most states, uh, clothing is generally going to be taxable. But in the states of Massachusetts, Minnesota, New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania, Rhode Island, and Vermont, uh, clothing is generally considered exempt. But here's the kicker, but only for everyday wear. And what is considered everyday wear? And, you know, a bathing suit, is that going to be considered everyday wear? Well, some people may wear it every day, but a state like Pennsylvania will often exclude it uh, from their definition of, of uh, clothing. It's not meant to be worn every day. It's uh, sporting uh, rather than everyday wear. Uh, formal wear. Uh, sporting goods, furs, they're all going to be generally taxable in states. Um, in New York, and by the way, before we even get to that, in New York, um, only items below $110 uh, each are taxable. So if you get something for $120, a uh, pair of pants for $120, that's going to be taxable. $110, not taxable. Um, at the state level, because many of the locals, uh, jurisdictions in New York, even though they're not home rule, um, they do charge tax. Uh, that is not a statewide exemption. So a lot of people come to us and the, after they got audited, hey, I was using Shopify and, you know, uh, I said clothing is exempt in New York. And unfortunately, there are special rules that you have to employ inside of Shopify in order to get the uh, taxability right um, in a state like New York, because it's not across the board. Number one, it's collected in very many of the locals. Number two, it's only for items that are below $110 each. Uh, Massachusetts, another example, um, it's $175. So anything... Uh, you're selling below $175, you know, a pair of shoes. It's not, you know, $175 for each shoe. It's $175 for the pair is going to be exempt. If it's above $175, it's going to be taxable. So these are uh, quite a bit of the, uh, the granularity when it comes to clothes. And when you're looking at charts, they don't always get this. Um, and some of the charts are older. We ha I had someone from the big four the other day telling one of my clients that clothing is not taxable in Connecticut. And uh, this, uh, this person was trying to take our client away. And uh, I looked at the work that they did and I went back to our client. I said, you realize that the citation they're citing for the state of Connecticut, um, it was repealed in 2007. So since 2007, uh, clothing has been taxable in Connecticut, except for sales tax holidays. They uh, did not go with, uh, with that big four firm. Um, here's some common mistakes when it comes to clothing. I see this mistake all the time. Accessories. I mean, clothing has a very specific definition in each state. And accessories are generally not part of uh, that definition. Now, how do you define an accessory? Well, you know, wallets. People say wallets are, are an accessory. Well, uh, wallets are generally not considered part of clothing. Uh, ties. Are ties an accessory? Well, yeah, ties could be an accessory, but they are considered part of the definition of clothing. Socks and belts, uh, again, they're usually 
uh, consider accessories that are part of the clothing, but earrings and necklaces and purses and handbags. We have some clients that when they first come to it, they've got them all listed as non-taxable accessories. And unfortunately, that's just not the case. States are very, very specific that do uh, have clothing exemptions as to what's included in that exemption. Now, here's something uh, I learned. Um, this is not something that makes common sense to me, but Minnesota, since uh, needles and thread and yarn are used to make clothing, they're also exempt if that's what their intended purpose is. I mean, you could be buying yarn to make crafts. Well, that's not an exempt use. But if you're using that yarn to make clothing, then that may be an exempt purpose purchase in the state of Minnesota. Uh, Connecticut, we talked about this way. Connecticut does tax clothing. It's a very common mistake. Uh, we see that people are not taxing clothing because they're relying on something that has been uh, superseded. Uh, they're basing this on older information, either because they you know, did a taxability study and never had it updated, or they're just looking at older information. I mean, I sometimes when I'm training CPAs, and CPAs are real smart people, um, when you're doing research, here's another tip. I don't have it on that other page. Don't stop at the first thing um, that supports what you're thinking. Um, because a lot of times the very next you know, piece of research you get to says, oh, by the way, that was superseded in the year uh, 2014, and here's how you get a look at this on a going forward basis. Um, some states, uh, in addition to the states we mentioned, have uh, clothing used in motion pictures may be exempt, uh, sales by or to certain nonprofits may be exempt, and then a lot of states have sales tax holidays, and clothing is included in their sales tax holiday. Uh, here's a chart on clothing. So again, it's not perfect, um, but uh, it is out there. Um, and uh, you can take a look at this. These are services in general. Um, you know, uh, they don't list out all the services on a chart. They just say services are generally not taxable. It doesn't mean that all services are not taxable. Um, again, not applicable in Alaska. Um, not applicable in Delaware. I mentioned this yesterday. Delaware doesn't have a general sales tax, but they do have um, a, a use tax if you're leasing tangible personal property in the state of Delaware. Um, that's very little known. If you are leasing things into the state of Delaware, uh, you got Nexus because you now own tangible personal property in that state and you could have a responsibility of collecting uh, the tax on that lease stream uh, or the uh, stream of rental payments. So uh, be careful uh, when you're utilizing charts. They usually, there's no footnotes here or anything. They don't even tell you. Most people have no clue that there's a tax in Delaware. Um, so again, the uh, it's very important. Um, that we dig deeper, that we just don't use charts. You'll get yourself in so much trouble if you're relying too much on charts. They're a tool. And like any tool, they have their use. You just don't want to use that tool for all situations. All right, so sales price, the determination of sales price, this is common language. The total amount of consideration for the sale, license, lease, or rental from retail sales of tangible personal property or taxable services valued in money, received in money or otherwise, whether received in money or otherwise. Uh, next line, very important. Without any deduction on account of any of the following, the cost of materials used, the labor or service cost, or any other expenses, all charges included prior to the transfer of title are included. So sometimes people try to get cute and they say, okay, we're going to make the taxable amount of what I'm selling you smaller because I'm going to include labor and they don't tax labor in my state. Um, so they break it all up and the state 
it's going to come back and say, no, all of that is part of your sales price. You should have taxed it all. All right, so we talked about this earlier on, services associated with the taxable sale. This is the drapes story. Um, goes into a little bit more detail there. Uh, lump sum sales, we talked about this earlier. You know, how is a transaction structured can have a major impact. Uh, agreements or contracts supersede invoices. So it's generally not enough just to itemize the invoice. You have to have the agreement itemized also. All right, Ellie, let's do the final poll question. Yeah, absolutely. Um, this is a pretty easy question we have here, right, Mike? So will you be joining us next week for the third pillar of a successful sales tax strategy, rates and sourcing? Um, that's on Tuesday. Well, remember, you do have to answer this in order to receive CPE credit still. And Mike, most people, it looks like you're joining us, which is great news. And a uh, few people are going to try, but um, thanks for joining us. Thanks for coming to these webinars. We love having you here. And let's close this up and wrap it up, Mike. Well, do we have any questions? We do. Well, let me get over to the questions really quick. So um, let's just jump right in here. So can you touch on the new Colorado retail delivery fee, including the upcoming 11-122 tax on this fee for some home rule localities? I uh, can't really touch on the home rule localities. I'm not up to speed on that, but what the retail delivery fee is, um, Ellie's home state of Colorado there, they, they uh, really love the environment. And they think that, you know, when people have things delivered to them uh, in something that has an engine, um, then there should be a fee on that. And that fee needs to be paid by the customer because they figure that their taxpayers, you know, wouldn't mind giving up 27 cents uh, per invoice uh, is what it usually works out to um, in order to help uh, uh, protect the environment. Um, it's really a pain in the neck to administer. Um, it's a second return. So uh, for all of you who are filing returns in Colorado, you have to file a second return for it. Um, if uh, the item is not taxable, um, then there is no retail delivery fee owed. Um, uh, and it's only for tangible personal property. So it doesn't apply to uh services um you know some of the problems are uh, how do you charge your customer because the state really wants to charge to your customer a lot of our clients say mike it's 27 cents I, I, it's going to cost me more to charge my customer um and change my software in order to get this done can't you just um you know uh file a return for me and 27 cents for each of my invoices. And right now the state is saying, yes, you can do that, but that's only a temporary solution. They want everyone to eventually start be charging your customers. So uh, we're seeing more and more of the different platforms out there uh, and the tax engines like Avalara uh, accounting for this and building it into their system. Uh, but for some, um, they're either have to do it on a manual basis or pay it out of their own pocket. Um, I just haven't read up. Uh, oh, Tanya. Hey, Tanya. I know Tanya. Um, I haven't read up enough on, on how this is going to work with the uh, locals charging a tax on that retail delivery fee. Uh, I know that some of the locals have come out and have said, we're not going to apply tax to that. Others are not taking the same opinion. Um, you know, I think eventually, you know, there'll be some sort of uh, litigation or maybe, you know, the state itself will crack down on this uh, kind of hard. You know, they have a lot of latitude in these local jurisdictions. I just don't have a good answer for you on that second part. All right, thank you. Thank you, Mike. And thank you for the question, Tanya. Um, let's do one one or two more here really quick. Um, if anyone has to head out right at 1230 or I guess 130, depending on your time zone, 
thank you so much for coming. Watch out for our follow-up email in 24 hours. It'll have uh, a lot more information on, I, we'll have the slides, we'll have more of the handouts and uh, thank you so much for coming. So Mike, can a business get into trouble if ta a tax is collected when it should be exempt? It depends on what you mean by trouble. So states are generally never going to give you a hard time for collecting too much tax. They'll accept as much tax as you collect. The key there is you got to turn in everything you do collect. Uh, for larger companies, the problem becomes, you know, these class action attorneys and they're trying to go after you and say that you collected tax when you should not have collected tax. Then it's going to depend on the state that you're in um, because you're not benefiting from that. You gained nothing by collecting that tax. Why should you uh, be held responsible if you, you know, collected it inadvertently and you turned it all into the state? Well, this has been litigated in a number of states. One of the more famous cases is uh, with Target in uh, California and, you know, coffee consumed on the premises is going to be taxable. Coffee consumed off of the present premises is not going to be taxable. Um, so Target was just taxing everybody because they didn't know if someone was going to turn around and walk off the premises or go sit at a table. And they got sued. And the judge threw it out and said, hey, Target didn't benefit from this one way or the other. And all of the money got turned into the, into the state. We're seeing more and more responses like that, but there are other states like Illinois and New York uh, where a class action lawsuit could become an issue for you. Um, in general, we tell most of our clients, it's better to over collect than to under collect, unless you're one of those really big companies and then you gotta get, you always should try to get it as perfect as possible. But I think the greatest sin is under collect rather than over collecting. Most of us are not going to be the target of a class action lawsuit where we could be the target uh, of an audit and have under collected. All right. Thank you so much, Mike. Um, do you want to do a, a couple more here? Sure. Okay. Um, so shipping and handling topic. Uh, would third-party billing be a way for a heavy freight charge item to bypass being taxable? I'm going to get off easy on this one. It depends. So it depends on the state. It depends on all the circumstances. Um, and it depends on even how we're defining the terms that they were using. So uh, it could be or it could not be. Um, I'd have to uh, get deeper into the details in order to uh, give you a better answer. All right, and um, is Colorado delivery fee applied only when shipping charge is billed to the customer? No, it's so whenever there's a delivery being made to the customer. Um, there's a, uh, uh, is the way that I understand it. So if it's a, a taxable item, then the delivery charge applies. If it's a non-taxable item, the delivery charge does not apply. All right. Thank you so much, sense. Mike. And thank you okay. so much, Mike. And thank, thank you, you everyone. <laughs> All right. You can close with us out here, Mike. Bye-bye.